Hello, and welcome to the GFC podcast. I am Patrick Mitchell. I'm the executive pastor here at Grace Fellowship Church, and I have with me today our lead pastor, Matt Murphy. Hello. And we are going to talk... Hello, Matt. <laughs> we are going to talk about unanswered prayer, uh, which, I'm sorry, I am a child of the 90s, so I cannot help but think of Garth Brooks. Sometimes I think... Did God he say prayer. something about unanswered He's, prayer? He sang a... Pr- You're from Texas, man. I should know that. Come on. I I don't. Yeah, well... Blocked out the 90s, I guess. (laughs) The 90s are gone. Uh, Well, we've been in this teaching series on the Sermon on the Mount, and yesterday you preached about ask, seek, and knock on the topic of prayer, and unanswered prayer was a major theme that came up in that message, and you've got more that you want to say about that. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I mean, I think that all of us, to some degree, we live with this reality of unanswered prayer. I mean, Jesus says, ask and you'll receive. And, and many of us who pray, we ask, and we don't know if we are receiving or will receive. There's mystery there. And so we talked a little bit about that yesterday, about the experience of unanswered prayer. That doesn't always mean that our prayers aren't answered. It just means we don't see it or it hasn't mm-hmm. happened yet. We, we also talked about the idea that the Bible is really comfortable with addressing the experience of unanswered prayer uh, that Jesus had, Moses had, David had, and and the Bible addresses that more Mm -hmm. than it does trying to clean up um, unanswered prayer. So there's some ambiguity there that the Bible leaves, and and that's okay, Um, but we did want to come back, I wanted to come back and give people a little bit of a, a, a bigger theological framework to hold this topic of unanswered prayer, because again, this is something that affects all of us. Right. Yeah, and, and as you said, like we want to have this conversation, and so the goal is not to answer every single question, and it's not to alleviate every possible misunderstanding. Uh, this is providing a, a framework, you know, theologically for how we understand and answer prayer, and and so there may be obviously things that you want to say that we can't even get to in this podcast, right. you know, just for the sake of brevity. So right. um, if you wanted to recommend some resources for people. Do you have a couple books in mind, two or three, that you'd recommend? Yeah, the the best book I've read on this topic is by Jerry Sitzer, and it's called When God Doesn't Answer Your Prayer. And uh, there's a fantastic book about prayer in general called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. I I think both of those books are exceptional. And today, we'll get into this in a minute, but a a lot of the content I want to share with you today, Patrick, and with everybody who's listening, is from a book called God on Mute, and that's a book by Pete Grieg. He's a, a Brit, I believe, from across the pond. Mm. And uh, he's got some amazing things to say, and I want to share that today. Yeah. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, we will uh, we'll put these resources in the show notes. You can check those out. Um, and, and as we would always say, even, you know, from... Uh, in a sermon, you know, we we recommend resources. It doesn't mean every word, you know, is something we would agree with, right. but it's, it's again, these are helpful uh, places to start if you have more questions. Yes, absolutely. So where do we start this? Well, a, a couple points, and then we'll jump in. Okay. Uh, and we alluded to this in the, the message, but there's mystery here. I, I've had a professor in seminary, he said, we diminish God when we remove all mystery from his workings. I still remember that Carl Laney said those words, and Mm. I think about that with a topic like this. We're not going to remove all the mystery, and we shouldn't try. Um, We need to live with some measure of mystery, and that's where faith comes in. The second thing I want to, to just say is that today, this content is about what is a theological framework for this. It's not as much about how to address the topic of unanswered prayer with someone who's mm-hmm. struggling. And I think that's a really important distinction. Yeah, I mean, you and I, we study and we, we teach theology. Um, one of the things that I've realized over the years is that there, there's theology, and then there's how we hold that theology. Mm. And I think if we're not careful, theology can really do a lot of damage. And so again, today we're talking about theology, but we've all got to be wise and loving in how we apply that. Yes, absolutely. Um, So I'll kind of jump into this book. I know you haven't read this book. I have not. um, Called God on Mute. Um, But it's really interesting the way that he approaches unanswered prayer. And I I really want to pull what I want to share out of just a portion of this book. Mm -hmm. And what he does, he gives 16 reasons that God may not be answering your prayer in a way you can perceive, which sounds like a lot. Um, and, and I want to share some of those. I'm not going to share all of them, um, and I hope it doesn't discourage 
the listener here. Uh, rather, I hope it gives us a greater depth of understanding biblically around this topic, and ultimately that it makes us want to pray more. So um, I hope you're ready. I'm going to see if you remember all of these things whenever we're done. Challenge accepted. Okay. Let's, do Let's it. see how you do. <laughs> uh, so here, here are some of the reasons why our prayers aren't answered. One of the reasons he gives is contradiction. Some prayers aren't answered because they contradict other prayers. Mm. So both of our kids are playing baseball right now. They and we've are. talked about this. You are coaching baseball. Coach Patrick. You know, it's the pay is why I do it. I, I don't blame you. Yeah. And you don't yeah. make enough I'm being a pastor. A lot. <laughs> so you need you need side a side hustle. Uh well this past weekend it was gonna rain. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee you one of the kids was praying for rain. And one of the kids on somebody's baseball team was praying that it wouldn't rain. That was actually my kid. He didn't want it to rain. He wanted yeah. to, to go play. And so it. what Pete Grieg says is that at any given moment, people are, play, are praying for contradictory things. Mm-hmm. And so clearly God can't answer everybody's prayers, right? That's right. you got two people circling a parking lot trying you know, to find a space to park, and they're both praying that God will provide an open space, but there's only one space. Yeah. And so in that scenario, God can only answer one of those prayers. Um, have you ever prayed for an open space in a parking lot? I, I am not ashamed to say that I, I often pray. <laughs> you for, often? Is that... And, and I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, Matt. It's often answered. Wow. You... I don't know what that says about me or God. <laughs> and more, probably more, about, more God. about you and uh, your your yeah. Uh, yeah. shallow prayer life. But you know, you know whatevs uh, to each his own, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, a question here, obviously, with this is okay. Are my prayers are they likely to be conflicting with those of someone else? So that's one of the points he gives. Another one, mm-hmm. he says, some of our prayers aren't answered because life is tough. Um, Romans has a lot to say about this, that creation is subjected to frustration or futility, and it hasn't been liberated yet mm-hmm. from bondage to decay. So, you know, tragically, we all we live in a broken world, and we know this. I mean, Samuel Beckett, one of my favorite quotes, he says, we live on earth and there's no cure for that. So it doesn't matter how much you pray, <laughs> you're not going to pray away the brokenness of our world. Um, And so sometimes when we rub up against the brokenness of life, um, it makes us uncomfortable. Obviously, we don't want it to be that way, and we pray that God would remove it. But but, but the the kind of world we're living in is a world right now um, that's a broken world. And uh, have you ever heard of the book Anti-Fragile? I have not. Okay, so the author, it's very interesting, Nassim Taleb, uh, he makes the point that based on the period of peace and prosperity that we've had in Mm -hmm. the West since the Cold War, that we are now in an unprecedented emotional and psychological state of fragility. Mm -hmm. Basically, he's saying that we feel entitled to an easy life. And so a lot of times we, we expect God to spare us from stuff that's just part of the human experience ever since the fall. It won't always be that way. I mean, Jesus is going to come back. So does that make sense, that that idea? Yeah, yeah, and I especially like that the notion of entitlement. Um, you know, the more something happens, the more you come to expect it, and then you move from that expectation into feeling like, well, I deserve this. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, seeing when that gets disrupted, then, whoa, what what's happening? This is what I've held dear, and, uh, you know, I'm owed this, and uh, we can get that way with God. Uh, like absolutely. In a <laughs> yeah. So yeah. fast. That's right, and that's a great point. And a lot of times we don't even know that we're believing that God owes us yeah. until things All right. Um, right. fall away. Another reason why some of our prayers aren't answered is doctrine. Uh, he says that our understanding and expectations, uh, expectations of God are misguided, and we know this. This can happen um, to all of us, and this kind of alludes to the, to the last point we made, but God's job, it's not to keep us from experiencing pain, mm-hmm. right? Um, we all want God to be the helicopter parent, right? Yeah. Who flies in and rescues us every time there's pain and suffering. But that's not who God is. I mean, just read the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, God is actually pretty comfortable with His people experiencing suffering to some degree, and He uses that. But God does not eliminate suffering from our lives. And Jesus Himself, I mean, He said, "In this world, mm-hmm. you will have trouble." Yeah. And yeah. so that's who God is, and, and so sometimes we need to think, okay, am I <laughs> the God that I am praying to, that I am thinking about, is that a God of my own imagination yeah. or the God of the Bible? Yeah, 
Well, and I mean, you know, language that's used to speak of God is Him as a refiner. And like, if He's putting us through the fire to to melt away the dross for the impurities, then, well, goodness, I mean, that that's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. So as you think about that, yeah, yeah, he, He's going to let us go through stuff. And so this kind of easy breezy, you know, life with God, that's just not a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, sometimes the greatest good for us, our sanctification, involves suffering and, and pain. Yeah. Um, another reason he gives for why prayers go unanswered is what he calls second best. He says some prayers aren't answered because God has something even better for us. And my guess is you have stories like that in your life. <laughs> yeah. I do. Where, God, please don't let this girl break up with me. God, please help me to get this job, et cetera. And you look back and you yeah. say, thank you. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. It's like you look, yeah, you get that perspective, and you're like, I had no idea what I was actually asking for. Yeah. So, muchas gracias right. for that. One. You right. know, like I'm glad I'm not married to her or whatever it is. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm glad the girl you're referencing is not listening to this podcast. You know, but you didn't use her name. So. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, yeah, or I don't. I didn't want that job. You know? Yeah, you know, yeah. That's that's so our experience. We yeah. all have that. That's right. And we, and we talked about this during the, the message that God is a good Father who gives good things, and uh, sometimes God has something better for us. We yeah. just don't know it yet. And so this is such a hopeful reality. Um, I, I think we need to be careful here to not... It's kind of the name it and claim it, like, God, you know, if yeah. God, you don't get that car, God's got a better car for you. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it is really hopeful that we know and follow a God who's redemptive, who's always working for our good. Yeah, and believing those are his motives and his intentions. Yeah, so it's good point. Yeah, if not this, then okay, there is something better for me, even yeah. if I can't perceive it as such. Yes. Another reason he gives for unanswered prayer is our motive, and this comes out of James for James, the brother of Jesus. He writes, "When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, mm. that you may spend what you get on your pleasures." Um, so clearly here. You know, James is saying, you're asking, you're praying, and you're not getting it, and the reason why is your heart, um, your motivations. And I think we need to be careful it, it, to not overplay this. It's not like any time we have unanswered prayer, there's something wrong with us. And the kind of childlike prayer that Jesus wants us to pray, you know, I mean, he says, you know, a kid comes to his father, can I have a piece of bread or, you know... Um, forget the other thing that he references, but this idea of yep. childlike prayer, you can't tell me that children always pray with 100% pure motives. Yeah, I mean, my kids do. I, I don't think anyone else's This do, is the though. way you've trained them, yeah. That, that's yeah, right. I get yeah. it. Perfect father, perfect children. Yeah, and I and I love that passage, too, because, you know, it's, you know, you don't ask for bread and get stoned, which they look very similar in the same way you don't ask for fish and snake, It's or it's the word eel. Like, you could make it look like it's, you know... It, like it's so it's it's even stronger in that sense of like God's trying to trick you. Like mm. you think you're gonna get something good, and He's like, mm -mm, "Gotcha." Yeah. yeah, like that's not that's just not the way that He works. Right. Um, right. So yeah, I love it. So yeah, so when we ask with impure motives, I think we understand that's part of the deal. I mean, all of us to some degree, I think, are gonna have impure motives, but God does desire our prayers to be aligned with His will, and mm. so. You know, again, motives, I, I think getting a Ferrari would be awesome, winning the lottery, that's probably not God's highest priority for us, and so this is a reminder of that. Another reason He gives for unanswered prayer is relationship. Some prayers aren't answered because God Himself is a greater answer than the thing we are asking for, and He, God, wants to use our sense of need to draw us into a deeper relationship with Him. And I, I think that this is so true about God. Um, George MacDonald, he, he has a quote, he, he basically says, what if the main goal in God's idea of prayer, what if the main goal is the supplying of our great, our endless need, the need of Himself? Mm -hmm. What if the good of all of our smaller and lower needs lies in this, that they help drive us to God? Yeah. And... Man, that's that's easy to say. That's hard to. Yeah, that's to the live. one. I'm so far that I'm just like have to take an extra breath because it's it's the one that feels like an out. You know, it's like oh really, oh I need more God. That's why he's not answering my prayer. Yeah, it's right. like okay, but if you really come back to it, if he is this good father yeah, yeah. who knows what's best for us, to give us something different mm. would, you know, it make him not be a good father. Right, <laughs> so. Right. Um, 
so yeah, if he himself is that greater need, then yeah. he's loving to let us experience that that drought or whatever it may be, right? Um, right. To, in order to come back to that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point, and and I think along with all of these, we kind of hold them together. Um, it's not like every ounce of pain in our lives is because God is saying, I just want you to be close to me. Mm -hmm. But there is this reality where our greatest good is intimacy with God That's right. himself. Yeah. Um, and at least in my life, a lot of what drives you there is, is pain and suffering. Um, another reason why prayers aren't answered is influence. And what Grieg says here is that God's the, the way that God works is primarily through influence and not through forced control. So he kind of makes a, a, a differentiation here between influence and power. Mm. And he says, if you track God's activity with his people across the scriptures, you see that God generally seeks to influence and right. not control. And so sometimes I think we're trying to, to pray in such a way, we're trying to exercise power over a person's life mm. uh, through prayer. And you know, God, I think, can do that, but it's against God's nature in yeah. a sense. I think a lot of times God does work through influencing people and putting people in, in others' lives who can influence them. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important um, point of clarity to talk about the difference in power or authority, you know, and influence. Mm -hmm. you, you can have the former and have influence, but you can also have influence without having that power or authority. Mm -hmm. And so there's just this relational aspect of... How am I coming alongside someone or showing them a, a potential, helping them imagine a better reality? Um, mm -hmm. And so to think about the fact that God isn't just up there, you know, as this puppeteer leveraging everything for his, you know, for his good. Like it's, it is him going, hey, I can, here's how I'm going to help lead you and guide you. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you mess it up along the way too. Yeah. Um, because yeah. you're going to learn, <laughs> you're going to learn from that right. as well. You'll learn about my character and about your your own um, inclinations Man, or that's so true. whatever. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, look at how God works with Adam and Eve and Israel in the Old Testament, the prodigal son. I mean, he, God is very comfortable with human beings making choices, and sometimes those are good, sometimes those are bad. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, an another reason that Greg gives, and this might throw you for a loop here, but he, he says some prayers aren't answered because of satanic opposition that God's okay. will is being directly contested by the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So we read in Ephesians, and we know um, that our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against the rulers, the powers, mm -hmm. uh, but, but at least for me and in, in my prayer lives, I don't think about that <laughs> when I pray. <laughs> not often. <laughs> um, there's this crazy place in the Old Testament, in Daniel 10, where he's praying, and Daniel doesn't get any answer for several weeks, and mm -hmm. he was a really righteous dude, but no answer. And finally, an angel comes to him, and the angel says to Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding, to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come in response. But, he says, the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days, and then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, maybe sometimes God is going to answer your prayer, but but some of the angels are detained by the prince of Persia. It's just a, a wild concept, it but is. again, this is part of the biblical worldview yeah. that we need to in integrate. Yeah. Well, and to hear Daniel using that that prince terminology in the same way the Apostle Paul uses it, you know, the prince of the power of darkness or the prince of the power of the air. Mm -hmm. um, man, it's like this... Yeah, this one chief demon or satanic agent yeah. who's assigned to Persia at this time. Right. And like there's this legit battle going on. Right. Um, and I think God shows us grace in that if we were able to see this battle raging, we probably wouldn't even get out of bed in the morning. It would be so overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. But we all could also use more of a, um, I think, an awareness that it really is happening. Yeah. Yeah. This is a real thing. Yeah. That's a great point. And that's part of the reason why we do pray, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think to your point, if we had a greater awareness, realization of the battle we're in, we probably would all pray more, live in more independence um, mm -hmm. on God. It's a great point. Another reason he gives for prayers being unanswered is faith. Um, sometimes prayers aren't answered because we don't believe that they right. will be. And there's a story in Matthew 17 and Mark 9 where the disciples, they're unable to cast out demons, 
and Jesus ties it mm-hmm. to their faith. Mm-hmm. He says, you don't have enough faith. And right. in Mark 9, he, he says, this kind can only come out by prayer, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, the, the Bible's clear that through the teachings of Jesus and the book of Hebrews, faith is a fundamental ingredient of effective prayer. Um, that, that that's what makes our, our prayers, in a sense, effective, yeah. is what Hebrews says. Now, it's, in a, it's not faith in a particular outcome, um, but it's faith in God Himself, right? Mm. And I think that's really key. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, it made me immediately think of, of James 1. You know, I just pulled it up um, when, when James is talking about if you lack wisdom and you need to ask God for it, but you've got to believe and not doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The one who doubts is like this wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And so this, this single-minded, wholehearted faith um, in the one to whom you are praying. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the focus. Yeah. Um, you know, for me to think, you know, we've, we've talked about this passage before, but, um, you know, that I'm going to look at that mountain and I can pray, and if I have enough faith, that that mountain will be thrown into the sea. Yeah. Will it really... <laughs> or is that, you know, is the God to whom we are praying capable of that? Uh-huh. And how much do I believe in Him Yeah, on that front? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember as a kid uh, thinking, if I pray hard enough, I can walk across this swimming pool. I'd be looking at it. <laughs> and uh, it's like, why would God want to do that, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think sometimes our prayer, it, it can be... It, we we you know, think about faith a little bit like a superpower. Like, man, if I had faith, I could do whatever I want. But it's it's more what you said. It's no faith in God that is aligned with His heart and His purposes in the world. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's a great yeah. point. Um, a couple more. He says that one of the reasons our prayers aren't answered is perseverance, that we give up. Okay. Um, you know, and Jesus, He touches on this where there's somebody in bed. I can't remember the reference. And Somebody's banging on the door, and, and eventually they get up and they yeah. answer it. And uh, another story like that where there's a judge and there's a widow. The, the widow keeps asking for justice until finally he gives in, mm-hmm. and he gives it to her. And, and it's interesting, in that story, Luke 18, right before Jesus tells that parable, Luke says that Jesus told his disciples this parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Mm. So there's a sense in which that widow stops banging on the door, right? Yeah. And she gives up, she doesn't get the answer. Yeah. And I think we got to be careful, again, not to overplay this, to think, you know, if I just keep going, because sometimes we just refuse to take a no from God, Yeah. right? God might be saying no, and we're like, no, I'm just going to keep going. But there is a sense in which God is saying, no, keep asking, keep seeking, keep yeah. knocking. Yeah. Right? yeah, I mean, we could like take a page out of you know, our all children's books here, and just you just keep on. You just pester those adults to death <laughs> until maybe they give in, <laughs> you know? And sometimes it works. And sometimes it does work. You just, it's like, all right, I can do this all day, yeah. all day. Yeah, you right, know, like, right. I can, I'm just going to keep going. And God invites that. And I think yeah. it's like, that's really interesting that he would just say, no, come on, just just pester me. Mm-hmm. It's midnight. I'm, I've been asleep for a while now, but that's all right. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. not like some surly old man, you know, I, like I can handle it. Right. It's very interesting to think about. Um, sin is another reason he says some people's prayers aren't answered. That's funny. I just started a sentence with sin. I don't, you know, it sounded pretty intense. Hmm. Some people's prayers aren't answered because of areas of disobedience in our in our lives. That's what he says. Mm-hmm. Um, and James, he he makes this connection. So in the New Testament, James five, um, he kind of he links our integrity and our prayers. Mm-hmm. And he says, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other that you may be healed. And then he adds. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we think about that second part, but there's a connection there. And, and James, he seems to be saying, if I'm reading this right, that when our relationship with God is right, our prayers are more powerful mm-hmm. and effective. Mm-hmm. And I mean, think about relationship, right? For, the, for those of us who are parents, this makes sense that we're more likely to grant our kids requests when they are, generally speaking, living in obedience, yeah. right? At least that's true of me as it, a parent. Well, you're you're a more you know fleshly father than I am. Um, <laughs> it's true. I treat my kids the same no matter what. Oh wow! That's no, amazing. no, 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 no. Scratch that. No, the ones that behave better get my stuff. <laughs> that's ah. kind of, that tends to be how it is. And absolutely. And, but yeah, when you think about that that element of sin, I mean, it's talked about in other places. Um, in First Peter, you know, Peter says, 
it, you know, he's talking to guys specifically at this point, and he says, hey, if you're mistreating your wife, mm-hmm. that's going to hinder your prayers, the effectiveness yeah. of your prayers. And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. You know, and so I think it's to that <clears throat> point of God is looking at us as his children going, you can't just be asking dad for stuff if you're mistreating your siblings. Yeah. You know, like you, you need to be righteous with others. And I'm going to be more inclined to hear what you have to say. Yeah, like yeah. That's, what a beautiful picture. Absolutely, and, and that is one of the last reasons he gives, which is justice. And, okay. he, and he says what you just verbalized that you know if we're mistreating people, especially the vulnerable, that God over and over again in the Old Testament, the quartet of the vulnerable, you know, the widow, mm-hmm. the orphan, the immigrant. Um, God, God always says, watch out for those people. And there's this very interesting place in Isaiah 58 where Israel they're crying out to God and um, and they don't understand why God's not answering their prayers, and it's very interesting because Isaiah writes to them, and this is God speaking through Isaiah, and, and yep. God says, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers, and your fasting, we, we could substitute prayer in there, it's the same, you know, they were fasting, they were praying, it ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists, mm. And what God says is you cannot do as you do today and expect your voice to be heard. So clearly there's a connection between God's responsiveness to us vertically yep. and our treatment of one another horizontally. And like you said, right. that's how we are as parents. I mean, if you mistreat my kids and then ask me for 20 bucks, you're not getting it. Yeah. You may not get it anyway. Right. Because no, I can be kind of stingy. I don't just throw <laughs> out money. Yeah, well, and I mean, thinking about, you know, in Proverbs, it's this came up um, in, my, in our trip to Rwanda in this last this session that we were teaching the Gospel of Mark, and we're talking about prayer uh-huh. and what might hinder prayers. Um, and in Proverbs, you know, um, Solomon or whoever wrote this particular one, it was, if you shut your ears to the cry of the poor, mm-hmm. then God's going to shut his ears to your cries mm. when you're praying, yeah. you know, is, is how I read it and understand it. And so it's just that element again, like we have got to be loving one another well. Um, and I think God will honor that. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like a, a genie. It's not the, yes, it's not the combination lock thing, but it is like there are principles at play and this is one of them. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. So lastly, you know, his... His last reason in the book, and I just love this, he, the, the reason he titles none of the above, <laughs> yeah. which, which essentially he's acknowledging that, hey, there may be reasons that I don't know about, mm-hmm. and there are reasons that God has that we don't know about. I mean, there's mystery here, and, and I think that's such a great perspective, and this is why we have to be so careful to not come to conclusions about why other people's prayers mm-hmm. are not being answered, because yeah. we don't know. I mean, the, the book of Job, his friends, you know, they're giving him sermon after sermon after sermon. Job, get your life together. And it's, it's just so interesting. At the end of the book, God comes to Job, and uh, we all know the story, but then God comes to the, these friends and says, you have not spoken the truth about me, but if Job mm-hmm. prays for you, I'll accept your sacrifices. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, they thought they knew why God wasn't responding to Job's prayers, but they were wrong. So we got to be careful mm-hmm. here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, to those, like, if if you're walking with someone through difficult times and they do feel like their prayers are not being heard, you know, Job and, and God speaking through him says, like, the, the greatest gift that his friends brought to him was when they were silent. Mm-hmm. They were just there. You know, those first, what, however many days where they right. were just sitting yeah, on the ground, days. crying with him, not speaking a word. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the ministry of presence that sometimes we need to bring to people. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great way to, to say it. Um, so, you know, for anybody who's who's listening, I, I think that these reasons for unanswered prayer in this book and some of the ones I've shared today, they're helpful because they give us a context theologically, and they do provide some questions. I think it's good to be asking, okay, is there sin in my life that I need mm-hmm. to confess? Are there relationships? Am I treating other people? Am I persevering in prayer, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but again, we got to live with this reality that we don't always know, yep. and and when we don't know, I think that the the encouragement, the invitation of God, it's to trust. And we talked about that again in the in the message yeah. that that's what God wants is for us to trust Him. And for those of you who who may be really struggling today, you know, my heart just goes out to you, and 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 my encouragement would be to just hold on to God. 
like a kid who's hurting and doesn't understand. Yeah. And we've all seen, as parents, that look in our kids' eyes when they're hurting and they don't understand, and, and, and we love them and we care for them, and, and we just want to sit there and be there with them. And God is that kind of a father. He loves us mm -hmm. um, unconditionally, yeah. and so hang on yeah. is what yeah, I would that's, say. That's a good word. It's a good word, and yeah, for everyone out there, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you, if you haven't heard it, to listen to the full message from Sunday. You can do that by visiting gfcnow.com slash messages. We would also would love to know what you thought about this podcast. Uh, this is something we'd like to do more often, so send in your comments or questions for a future episode to podcast at gfcnow.com. And then if you take 30 seconds to subscribe and leave us a five-star review, that would help us continue to spread the word of the gospel. And then lastly, if you're new to GFC, we would love to get to know you. You can text one word, new here, just put it all together, new here, to 94,000, and we will follow up with you this week. We hope you have a wonderful day.